I'm Tom Swartz. I work at the Penn Manor School District. I've been flying multi-copters, drones, for probably about a better part of six months on the low side, somewhere close to a year maybe, if I had to guess. It's been a while. Um, and I've really kind of d dove into the subject and um, if anybody watches the news, it's very much a big kind of hot topic discussion uh, very recently. A lot of people are kind of pushing you know, both sides, you know, should we regulate them, should we not regulate them? So I figured it would be a good chance to kind of describe you know, like what exactly are these things, like how do they work, you know, what, what exactly are we talking about when we want to regulate them or whatever. So uh, let's get started. <coughs> so the first, first off, let's talk about some rules and regulations. As of yesterday, the rules are you have to stay below 400 feet. <laughs> you have to stay below 400 feet. Uh, you have to keep line of sight with, with whatever you're flying. It can't be you know, out you know, over the horizon or something like that. Um, if you're going to fly within a certain area of a, of an airport, you have to make sure that you clear it with the tower. Otherwise, you know you might have airplanes that aren't very happy. Um, so on and so forth. The only thing I want to point out here, um, keeping visual line of sight, is kind of a gray area when uh, people use goggles to fly first person per, first person view. Um, that's a really big uh, burgeoning sport. I guess recently, people will buy these little tiny, probably about uh, probably about the size of the multicopter here. Uh, they'll buy a, a tiny quad, and they'll race them really fast through trees or in through a, a parking garage or something like that. And they'll have a camera mounted on it, and they'll kind of play it like battlefield style or something like that. It's called pod racing, right? Kind of like pod racing, exactly. So that. Um, that's kind of a gray area because you have your goggles on and you can actually see where the quadcopter is flying, but you don't actually have line of sight to where the quadcopter is. So that's kind of something that a lot of people are kind of going to figure out. Um, don't, don't, don't put a gun on a drone. <laughs> 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 the kind of to extend and expand upon some of the rules, uh, you have to make sure that you fly within those rules. And as long as you fly within those rules, you currently, as like I said, as of yesterday, don't need special permission to kind of fly your quadcopter. Um, as long as you're doing it recreationally, you're fine. If you're using it for a business, if you're using it for something else, it's no longer recreational and you need uh, what they call a section 333 exemption uh, where you can fly something in United States airspace in order to uh, work for your business. So when I talk about quadcopters and drones, this is what I'm talking about. Something that's kind of tiny, uh, can be pretty small. Something like this, it could have four, it could have eight propellers, but you have to keep in mind when people talk about drones, they're also talking about something like this. They're huge. They can be very huge. They're very, very big. <coughs> so just to kind of give the distinction, personally, there's no actual definition. But my personal definition is for a multicopter, it's something that you fly yourself. It doesn't have a lot of automatic control. It's something that a hobbyist or a person you know, just off the street would fly, and it's kind of small, very inexpensive, relatively, and you know, it's easy, easy to procure. A drone, however, in my definition, is something that the something, uh, government would have. They cost millions of dollars. They're humongous. They could fire missiles and kill you. <laughs> something like that. So let's talk about some of the parts of a multicopter. And when I first got into the hobby, this is kind of something that I wish people had explained a little bit better. It's very much, at this point, since it's very new, it's kind of figured out as you go along. So um, 
to kind of go over some of the parts, you have what's called a flight controller. And on this guy, it's a very tiny circuit board here. Uh, they usually, uh, what a flight controller does is it takes the inputs and converts, converts them to a signal that the motors can then uh, use to spin and you know, keep itself level. Um, they could, uh, flight controllers can use GPS, they could use um, barometers to keep, you know, uh, keep the device at a certain height and in a certain position. Um, it can get very advanced and very expensive uh, very quickly. But the most basic controller, like uh, what's on here, um, basically just keeps it level and makes sure that all the motors are spinning you know, at the right speed. Um, the next one is an electronic speed control. And what uh, an, uh, an ESC does is it takes the signals from your flight controller and converts it to uh, three phase to spin the motors. It'll spin it you know, one direction. You can get a, a, an advanced ESC, which will take and allow you to spin the motors in two directions. So you could fly it this way, flip it upside down, and then spin the motors backwards to fly it upside down. Cut the grass if you want. Um, yeah. The motors, you can have brush motors like I have on here. Um, they use little copper brushes and spin around on the inside uh, to uh, transfer the electricity. You can also have in runners and out runners. Those are actually uh, brushless motors and they're a lot, uh, they spin a lot faster. They're a little bit more reliable for the, uh, for the purposes of multi-copters. However, they don't give a lot of torque. So if you have really big propellers, they might run into problems if you have um, kind of cheap outrunner or inrunner motors. And last but not least, you have to have some sort of receiver and transmitter. On here, it's this little tiny red circuit board. Uh, most, of the, most of the devices use uh, 2.4 gigahertz, which is Wi-Fi. Um, you could get more advanced ones that go 5.8, and they have even more advanced ones, cough government, but uh, they use satellite control. So you can bounce it off of a satellite and then kind of get it from anywhere in the world. So some basics about quadcopters and helicopters in general. So everybody knows what a regular helicopter looks like, but I don't think it's quite intuitive how an actual helicopter works. So you have, by conservation of momentum, the propeller on the top spins and the body of the helicopter wants to spin the opposite way. You guys remember when you spin a tire, that physics thing where you spin a tire and you stand on the platform and it spins? That's exactly what this is doing. So the propeller is spinning and the body of the helicopter wants to spin the other way. The tail rotor, however, will help push or pull the end of the, the helicopter in the correct direction. That's kind of how it moves, moves around. It's a lot more simple for uh, a quadcopter, however, what they do is, rather than kind of balancing things like that, they just tip in the direction that they want to go. So uh, you could have a roll, which is left or right. Uh, this is the front, by the way, the white ones. So you could do uh, a roll, which is left or right. You could do pitch, which is up and down. Uh, you could do yaw, which is spinning left and right. And then you could do uh, throttle, which makes it go faster. So in order to have stable flight, what the propellers do, um, just kind of like the helicopter example, they spin uh, two, mo two pairs of motors at the same speed. So one, uh, one pair will spin one direction, the other pair will spin the other direction. They kind of cancel each other out, conservation of momentum. If you want to pitch or roll, you'll spin one pair faster or slower so that it'll, it'll kind of wobble around that axis. And in order to yaw, to turn like this, just like a helicopter, you spin one really fast and it kind of pirouettes around that point. <clears throat> so that's the basics. It's obviously a lot more in depth than that. It kind of goes in very deeply into control theory. I don't know if anybody's played around with industrial machines before or anything like that, but PID control is kind of a big, um, 
kind of a big hot topic in, in industrial machines. It allows, uh, basically what that means is it allows you to quickly and accurately get to the set point. So in terms of a quadcopter, uh, what you could do is when your device is at a crazy angle, the PID control feedback loop will kind of help self-write it very quickly and with minimal calculations. So I'm going to show a practical example here. Let me get this all wired up and ready to go. So you have PID. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. Uh, the proportional term means that if the device is uh, a certain proportion out of alignment, it'll, the controller will work in that proportion to bring it back. So I'm going to spin the motors up here. And you can kind of hear the motors working a little bit harder as I turn it. The integral term is a little bit more complicated. It takes in, into account how far out of alignment it is and for how long. So if it's sitting here stuck for a long time, it's going to gradually work a little bit harder to try and bring it back. So uh, this works really well when you have a quadcopter that's getting blown in the wind. It'll try to fight back and go back against the wind. So you would have it and it'll sit here. And you can hear it spin up. The derivative allows the flight controller to make sure that it doesn't actually overshoot where it's going. So it'll go from here, and when the, the proportional and integral work, it makes sure that it, th it goes back to exactly here instead of back over here. I have to repeat the cycle over and over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wiggle this, and you'll hear it go wah, wah, wah. So you can hear that, that derivative uh, function kind of coming in. And it makes for some very interesting and very neat flight. I'm going to try not to hit anybody here. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so as you can see, it gets kind of, <laughs> it's a little complicated. <laughs> How long have you been doing that? Six days? <laughs> it's the air handling, that so let's talk about it. That light came out of nowhere. That light came out of nowhere. It hasn't been here a long time. So, like that that well anyway. honestly. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, you know, it kind of allows you to um, make sure that it doesn't end up flipping over, except when you hit a light. <laughs> Yeah. What are the laws for flying these things indoors? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can. You do whatever you want indoors. The FFA, the FAA doesn't care. <laughs> so uh, as everybody was kind of chuckling, and as everybody probably heard, yesterday they kind of announced some new changes that are coming down the pipeline. Um, they kind of announced that nothing's set in stone yet, but you might have to register whatever you get, be it something kind of cheap from Amazon like this that you got for $25, $30 um, to the, the big guys that you build yourself. Um, nobody really knows yet, but uh, we'll see, we'll kind of see on November 20th when they finally announce their, their actual changes. Um, what's kind of exciting, however, is um, in this, this panel discussion, they're going to have a lot of uh, really kind of high profile folks from the quadcopter and flight and airline community kind of giving uh, feedback on, on this as well. So it's not just going to be you know, people are like, oh, I don't like these drones. So um, it, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of hopeful. Uh, it will, I personally believe that it will kind of help crack down on the amount of knuckleheads that we have flying over the White House. I don't know why you would do that. but. Um, Obviously, people who break the rules should be kind of punished in some way. And this is, I think, a step in the right direction to help uh, 
uh, prevent them from doing something as silly as putting a gun on a quadcopter. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So for the five mile rule, does that mean something even as small as that, that technically you should have to call the local airport and say I'm planning to fly my literally hand-sized quadcopter? <laughs> It's, it's very much a gray area. If you're going to stay below the tree line, you're probably okay. okay. Um, a lot, uh, the main problems occur when people go out and they buy like a DJI Phantom and they end up flying like a mile up in the air. You can't see it. It's behind the clouds and airplanes are flying right by it. Things like that. Okay. As long as you're being reasonable, you're probably okay. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be too too concerned about it. Okay. So yeah. Does that mean you don't bother calling for, for permission locally? Where I fly is not within the five mile radius, <laughs> so I'm okay. Um, but it probably wouldn't hurt if you're gonna. It, the closer you are, the the more it kind of would be uh, important to call. Um, like if you're if you're gonna go stand right outside the uh, the airstrip. And probably, you know, that would be an idea to call them. But, you know, if you're just doing it in your backyard, staying below the trees, you're going to be okay. So you wouldn't bother if we walked outside? No. Okay. If I keep it in my backyard, am I allowed to strap a gun to it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a totally different area of expertise for me. What about you? Not like your name. <laughs> I just want to operate in my yard, but outside my neighbor's window. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we put that gun on it. No one heard that. Is there a specific list of things you are and are not allowed to attach to these things? Like, I know you're allowed to put cameras on, but like, are they allowed to like carry cargo on them? Amazon. Or is that like not? You you can. I mean, it all. It, it, the cargo part kind of falls into the line of sight air issue. Uh -huh. So when Amazon takes their drone and they fly it. You know, six miles away from their spot, obviously they can't see it anymore. Yeah. So, you know, that's not within the, the law mm -hmm. anymore. However, you can, if you want, you could put, you know, like those little army men on parachutes, take them up and drop them down if you want. That's totally okay. fine. You know, whatever you want to do. Are there any groups that have formed around like applied uses or interest groups, like oh. citizen science looking for um, new archaeological sites or? doing laser scan, you know, 3D uh, mapping of cave sites, for mm -hmm. instance. That's actually a really interesting question. And there's a ton of groups that have spot, uh, you know, popped up that do you know, exactly things of that sort. Um, there are uh, a couple people that do crop mapping. So they'll fly over uh, fields and kind of make sure, you know, okay, the corn here looks good. You know, the soybeans here look OK. Um, what's that weird thing looking there? Is somebody planting weed in mine? <laughs> You know, things like that. Um, I've seen some groups, they have uh, really crazily designed multi-copters and they're hoping to use them for firefighting. So they'll fly and they'll use um, some special mixtures of, uh, like, it's, it's kind of like a, a, basically a hovering fire extinguisher. So it'll come out, you know, if your car's on fire, it'll fly out real quick, you know, douse your car and fly back. Uh, so there's a lot of really, really interesting and novel ideas uh, that are kind of popping up. Um, and personally, I think the biggest concern is um, with people not kind of abiding by the law, it's going to kind of squelch this interesting uh, development coming up. The uh, slide you had on there for like PID or whatever that was talking about the like, sort of different approaches to solving common problems or whatever. Um, are those, like, each one of those things I could kind of see how there would be different physical approaches, like different algorithms almost that you could use to, to solve them? Like mm -hmm. you had mentioned that um, this quadcopter uh, with the derivative part, uh, in order to solve the problem of going too far, it just kind of wobbles back and forth until it stabilizes. But I could also imagine there could be an approach of, like, uh, acceleration and then deceleration as you start getting to the point so it almost lands perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, 
is that the type of, can you have any option in like sort of recreational drones to like program that and play around with those types of items? You do, not for the, the inexpensive ones like this. Um, however, I have, I have a kind of bigger one. I didn't want to bring it because it's really scary looking and I, I know there's not a lot of room here. Um, I had a little trouble with this one, so you can only imagine. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but with the bigger ones, they have more advanced flight controllers that you could program pretty much anything you want. Um, yeah, so they're, they're really kind of customizable in that way. Cool. And when you change all of those, those settings, they, it could take totally different flight characteristics. Yeah. So you could have, you could kind of dial it in so it's really smooth, really stable. Or you could also kind of bump the numbers up so it's real quick and real maneuverable for racing, for example. Cool. Is there, is there any uh, thought on uh, whether, whether there will be a fee associated with uh, registration? Or, and, and it, like, it kind of as a follow up, is there like, any guidance from the government's position on this that they're trying to disincentivize people from entering this as a hobby? or? I haven't heard of any fees or anything, any discussion of that sort yet. Um, however, the government seems to uh, seems to want to encourage this very much uh, because they kind of see that uh, you have the practical applications, not just people you know being silly and flying into a, a Boeing. Um, so, a couple. It was probably around April, I guess they had announced preliminary instructions. Those are the ones that I had up you know, very early on in the slides. Um, those, are, those are some of the regulations that they, um, that they proposed back in April. Um, up until that point, you were basically kind of only limited by whatever the American Model uh, Association, uh, basically RC groups, um, had proposed for you know, rules and regulations. So this is the actual first, first time in forever, honestly, that there's actual government intervention, in this sort of thing. What's the protocol for like uniquely identifying uh, the, the signals, like for transmitting and receiving flight control? Each transmitter has a unique pattern. For example, a lot of them, the one that I use, um, my big hobby style, um, they use frequency hopping and things like that, and they have a specific bind um, method that you have to use, and that kind of um, matches the, the frequency hopping pattern to that receiver. So you can have multiple devices on the same frequency kind of um, working at the same time. Previously, they used to use, um, you actually, when you, when you would go to an RC, a uh, certified RC airfield, you'd have to get a crystal oscillator, and they would, they would give you a crystal oscillator that you would put into your remote and that would be your frequency for, for your device. That's awesome. <laughs> it, working with crystals, not so scientific, but um, yeah, uh, it, it used to be you know, very rudimentary, um, but now with kind of um, ICs and making it all digital, it's, it's very, very uh, precise and interesting. Has anyone tried to do a uh, cellular connection from receiver to transceiver? They have, yes. Um, I didn't mention mention those. There's a whole there's a whole slew of different types of connections that you can use. Okay. Um, cell connection is one of them. Um, they they also have um, it's kind of like the Ubiquiti wireless. They have it's like very long range point to point um, point to point stuff. A lot of people who use that um, not specifically with multicopters, but they'll use it for airplanes where they can fly you know maybe about half a mile out down down a field or something like that and you know, still have a signal, so, yes? Is there a limit to the size a person can have? 55 pounds <laughs> seems to be the current limit. Um, if you're anything larger than that, you have to file for some sort of actual aircraft um, certification. Uh, but honestly, if you're more than 55 pounds, you're probably pretty huge and you could carry the associated equipment anyway, so. Um, yeah. Let me just remark on, no one should be putting guns on these things, but can you imagine, like, so much effort had to go into this. <laughs> <laughs> not, only, not only you had to, like, 
figure it out. It looks like a lot of tape, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of duct tape. A lot of duct tape. Getting the gun on the on there is almost is the easy part. Like you have to not only rig something up to <coughs> pull the trigger. The whole quadcopter needs to absorb the shock. If you watch the yeah. actual video, every time it shoots, it like almost slips backwards. But it doesn't. So they didn't. It, 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 it almost it does. Like it's, 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 it's definitely should not. Should just do it. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's the magic of the PID. It's like, it's the PID is a key. I was asking how out of control of the shock that was pointing. I was thinking for 50 pounds, if the shock is my weight, I'm 115. No, like you could put a shock on one of those things. You know, I'm intrigued about, like, I guess, what you would need to do to a, like, a quadcopter to actually program it to more intelligently absorb the shock of a oh. gunshot. That would be crazy. Fly like, into like, it almost? Like, yeah, almost yeah. like every time you pull the trigger, you have to, like, ramp up your, your pitch, but you can't like, do it literally too much because you don't yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm sure Boeing yeah. would love your input on that. <laughs> 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 this is a wonderful question. I wrote this algorithm so you can shoot a gun and it doesn't move at all. So, uh, just to kind of bring it back, uh, everybody seems to have uh, seems to be interested in the um, the destruction part. Uh, why not? Uh, if if you're really interested in that, however, uh, look up online. There's a a group called Game of Drones. Uh, they they make quote unquote indestructible quadcopters, and they they have competitions where they fly them and battle them. Kind of like battle bots. Just, just kind of like battle bots. Battle bots. Um, awesome. So the whole point is to try and see who who has the most rugged and indestructible uh, quadcopter. So definitely check it out if you're interested in that sort of thing.